Hello and welcome again to the Paddlecast with me, Etienne Stott, brought to you by British Canoeing. Welcome everybody. I know it's a beautiful evening out there tonight and really appreciate you coming in tonight with us, uh, having a chat and uh, it's so good to have you along and very much feeling a great sense of gratitude for you being here. So yeah, last week we were talking all about access with Guy Shrub Scholl, uh, the author of the book, Who Owns England? Shrub Soul. It's a difficult one to get my head, my, fear, my mouth around that one. So he, he was in with Nick Hayes, the author of the book of Trespass. We talked about land ownership in England, the concept of trespass and where it came from, and all of this, uh, you know, how this connects to the rivers that we love and our kind of quest for greater access to those places that we want to go canoeing, kayaking, and stand up paddleboarding, whatever you want to do. And we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, getting out and about in the paddle cast, getting into the natural world, those kind of beautiful blue and green spaces, and how getting outside. You know, to exercise is one of the best things we can do, not just for our physical health, but our mental health and well-being too. You know, this has been particularly valuable, I think, during this peculiar COVID-19 lockdown period that we've all been kind of experiencing and going through. And so tonight we're going to go explore this even a little bit more in depth um, because we've got two fantastic guests who I'm going to introduce shortly. But first of all, uh, just don't forget, if you've missed any of the previous episodes, uh, including last week's one, they're all still available on the British Canoeing Paddlers Portal, Facebook page, and the YouTube channel. So you can definitely go there and catch up with them if you want. And if you like, we've also converted these episodes into podcast format. So you can find them in there and you can listen to them. There's all the episodes that you've seen already. There's the episodes around female paddling with the She Paddles Ambassadors, the stand-up paddleboarding episode with Bill Bailey, the amazing comedian, musician, and general legend. We had Tales of Adventure with Nuri Newman, Sal Montgomery, Bren Orton. We had a good Q&A session with British Canoeing's Chief Executive David Joy and the Chair John Coyne. Uh, we've had all sorts going on. It's been absolutely fantastic, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed them. And if you're listening to these again or listening on the podcast, welcome to as well. It's lovely to have you along, and uh, I hope you're enjoying them too. Ah, well, so back to this week. We've got two really cool, fascinating and interesting people with us. We're going to be talking about paddling and how the great outdoors can help our mental health. But it's really important just to talk tonight. We're going to be delving into some potentially tricky uh, and, and interesting and difficult territory. And some, some of the topics we're covering could be quite sensitive. And so for some people, these could be a trigger for those with mental health issues, perhaps. So we're going to be talking about how people can seek help towards the end of the paddle cast. So that's just to be uh, aware of. So but now, yes, I'm joined by Darren Clarkson King and Nick Ray. I'm just going to uh, say hello, gents. How are you guys doing? Good, thanks. Hi, guys. <laughs> All right. So, yes, thank you so much for coming in. And I'm just going to introduce you properly. So, yes, Darren Clarkson King. Well, he is uh, an amazing guy. He's got a big reputation that's being connected to some big rivers and some big mountains. We're going to unpack some of that later on. But he remains the only paddler to have kayaked all the rivers that flow from Everest, along with K2. And he's a writer, adventurer, expedition provider, river consultant, mentor, and inspirational speaker. So Darren's got a bit to talk about as well. And we've also got Nick. And Nick Ray lives on the beautiful Isle of Mug. And we've just been talking before we started the broadcast how sweet it is to live up there. I think uh, many of us be perhaps envious of such a beautiful uh, place. He's currently a sea kayaking adventurer, but he's done loads of stuff all around the world in the outdoors all his life. And it's really interesting catching up on both of these guys. You can find out more on the Internet. They've got really loads of content out there. Really interesting. Uh, Nick's got a really cool blog that I should also encourage anyone to read. Uh, it's really deep, very, very thoughtful and very Thank cool. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Nick now basically does all sorts of bits and pieces on, to uh, on Tobermory. He volunteers for the RNLI Lifeboat and he's on the Lifeboat's fundraising committee. And he's also, Nick does inspirational speaking and, and I've mentioned he has this blog, Life Afloat. So gents, absolutely fantastic to have you in here today. And I'm super grateful for you spending the time in here. I, I'm sure it's nice weather where you are, but we're all in here tonight. Hopefully, we're going to have a good chat. So, yeah, I was thinking. Oh, sorry, go on, say that again. 
Oh, that's said perfect. You know, it's, oh, no worries. Uh, nice, it's nice to be in the shade, isn't it? Yeah, man, it's I'm sweating a little bit here. I've got to be honest. So, yeah, man. Well, Nick, I'm gonna start with you a little bit, if that's okay. I'd just yep. like to um, basically read in your about me page on your website. It's quite extraordinary. It comes in, you know, really kind of very, very clearly. It starts, you know, it's quite, uh, quite um, authentic and very clear. You've lived all over the world and you've taken part in some adventures. And you know, done stuff that loads of people just you know wouldn't even dream of. But at the same time, you're really open about the mental health challenges that you've ba- you've been battled, and you're still mm. here today, including an attempt on your own life last year. So yeah. I'm yeah. personally glad you're still here, and that's really you. You know, I think it's really important, and I'm very grateful for that. Mm. But I know you know you've been talking about your mental health is a big part of the work you do, and you're trying to open this space up. Or would you like to tell me a little bit about this just for the for people who haven't perhaps had a chance to read your website and, and perhaps who don't know you? Uh, oh, gosh. Um, I guess all my life, adult life, I've worked in the outdoors. <clears throat> Started off with Outward Bound, worked with Outward Bound for about 12 years. So I've always been interested in how people tick, you know, that personal development mm-hmm. side of things. Um, and being in the outdoors has always been a huge part of my life growing up in the outdoors. I grew up in Africa. And uh, so it's always been my my space, I suppose. The outdoors has always been my space. And over the last 20 years, I guess, I've been living with depression, but it's steadily got worse mm. uh, until, as you say, last year came to a crunch. Um, but I've always found solace in the outdoors. You know, I've always mm. found that uh, when things are really tough for me, the place for me to be is, is either in my kayak, out at sea or up, up a mountain somewhere or just walking a you know, gentle path somewhere. Um, yeah, and I think um, just through my own journey, I've learned a huge amount about what being in the outdoors can mean for me and hopefully what it can mean for other people as well. And, so, and as I've opened up more about my mental health, troubles and how I've worked with my recovery uh, I've realized that for so many other people this is this is true for them too um, and that uh, you know something that we always talk about you know when you when when you need to clear your head go for a walk or go for a, a kayak but uh, it's I suppose for me it's about making a bit more of that you know making more meaning of that and um, I've always been somebody who I suppose been more of a thoughtful journeyer you know I've never mm. really never just put my head down and paddled just to get from A to B. I've always, you know, I've always felt that there's, there's something more to gain from every, yeah. every paddle stroke really. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if I've answered the question, but, um, no, no that's yeah, really good. Know. And I think it's, it's really, you know, it's really interesting this idea of personal development. I think we're going to come to this with, with Darren yeah. as well. You know, there's something that really, really links you with there. And, and so Darren, you know, I, I know you are really passionate, about how you know nature and the outdoors you know is connected into this kind of mental health and i just wonder if you would have a you know just a little bit share a little bit about your experience and how that has helped you so so for me like kayaking is the time when all the troubles of the world this is me personally and i think it translates to a lot of people but i can only speak for myself Mm. Uh, it's when all the troubles of the world disappear and you can just be in, you can just be in the moment, whether it's making an eddy you've made a thousand times, or you're exploring a new river. But you can just be in that moment. You know, as a, as a competitive paddler, you just making that move over and over and over again. Mm. And as a recreational paddler, maybe you're going to a river that you know a lot, uh, and there's a familiarity there, it's like seeing an old friend. But then there's new rivers, uh, and you can just be in that present moment, can't you? The water's rushing past, or the surf's crashing if you're at the sea, and you can just be in that moment. Uh, and for me, there's nothing centers me more than being in a deep gorge somewhere in the Himalayas. Mm. And, it, and it doesn't have to be class five, uh, but it's always nice when it is. Uh, it doesn't need to be, but that's a bit like life for me. You know, you have hard times that you feel all boxed in, and then all of a sudden it becomes class two and it becomes flat. Mm. And, and life's like that, and that's the way I see paddling. Uh, and I, I am very thoughtful on it. And, you know, I, I see there are a lot of parallels in the way that life pans out and the, a river journey pans out or a sea journey pans out. Mm. Uh, it can teach you quite a lot. 
I, I think we can all, uh, me certainly, I love, you know, river analogies, you know, analogies to do with our sport. They seem to work and people connect with them so well because I think people can understand how we've got currents and and forces beyond our ourselves, you know. We've got, like, constraints and there's us, you know, the kind of, you know, how we choose and how we do things and I suppose there's all sorts of interesting analogies. So it's good to good to hear. And this is a sort of uh, area that I'm I'm really I'm really keen and interested in. And I suppose, uh, Darren, you, you said something. Uh, I, I saw it in your blog. You know, you're really passionate about this um, self development side of things. Yeah. You know, and I, I think we, I think we all are by the sound of things. So let's talk a little bit about that. What what do you okay. see? What does canoe and kayak in these outdoor spaces? What they do for a person? So, you know, for me, I've, I've seen it in other people, but again, I can't vouch for people because we all, we're all unique and we all have unique experiences. But kayaking for me challenges us in a way that I can't find any other sport that does that. While it is a team sport, you know, you rely on your peers for safety and things like that. It's also an individual sport and mm -hmm. you can push yourself, and, or recreation or whatever it may be, and you can push yourself maybe just a little bit past your comfort zone Mm. Uh, within a sort of regulated space of risk, if that makes sense. And uh, for me, it's all about making dynamic risk assessments and being aware enough of your personal space and personal abilities and developing that confidence to make those moves or make that river trip, uh, going to new places and things like that. Does that sort of answer what you were yeah yeah no it's yeah, interesting yeah. i mean i think nick i could see you nodding as well because i think you are, i've even read up on your your blog to talk about like risk assessments and yeah definitely dynamic think, um, sort of sense of that i think it's, it's incredibly me metaphorical you know you the experiences for example today uh we're paddling and um had this massive thunderstorm came through massive and uh you know being on the on the sea in a sea kayak when a thunderstorm's coming through isn't really a good place to be, but we 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 risk assessed and we decided that we're just going to stick close to the shore, and we ended up having this most amazing experience. You know, the the rain was stair rod uh, hard, and the water was bouncing up off off the surface, and um, the lightning and the thunder were echoing around the mountains around us. Oh, wow. uh, absolutely incredible experience, and um, and yet we both felt very safe. I was with a friend, and um, you know, the powers that be would say we should never be out there. But that dynamic risk assessment, trusting, trusting your wisdom, trusting your judgment, um, and then going through that sort of process of a little bit of feeling a bit edgy about it, but then sticking with your choice, and and then coming through the other side, having this ama amazing story to tell. Mm. Um, and I don't think we were in danger because there's so much high ground around us, uh, and. Um, it was just incredibly atmospheric and if you know i suppose over time i might draw some learning from it but i think it was one of those experiences where i was just so glad to be alive you know i think that's it i get these experiences when i just suddenly realize that here i am in this incredible uh situation that um, not many people would ever find themselves and certainly it's the first time for me really to be out in that kind of weather and uh and of course, around us, we had seals swimming and there were seals with their pups and the pups were swimming alongside their mums and a golden eagle flew overhead. And it was just all very, was, everything came together to create this one incredible experience, which was basically all day. And uh, so I've come off the water just buzzing, really. And, um, and, nice. and, and, I think that, and I think that's just, you know, that's what it, that's what it does for me. It, you know, it's being in the moment, but then once the moment is passed, is keeping that memory alive or having created the story is, is it's a story I can tell myself from time to time when the chips are down or I'm a little bit nervous about my judgment in other areas. I can refer to this and say, well, do you remember, you know, to myself, I can have this conversation. Well, remember when you're out in Loch Sunot and the storm came through and you, you didn't run for the shelter, you, you kind of stuck with it mm. and you ended up having this incredible experience. And, uh, you know, there's a little bit of risk, of course. I mean, that's that's. Uh, I have to hold my hand up and say we were we we made that choice. But um, at the end of the day, we, as I keep saying, it was just an incredible outcome. Yeah. You know? 
No, and that's the interesting thing. I hear you talk about stories there, and I think that's a big part of our canoeing, kayaking, you know, paddle, paddle, canoe, paddle sport community. It's the stories yeah. we have, right? Um, you know, you, the stories you make for yourself, and the stories of you know ancient, ancient expeditions. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. About some of them, you know, old races here and all there. You know, oh, do you remember that time? I get Darren. You must have some absolute belters. There, there must be a never a dull moment when 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 you're around to get some of these stories out there. Well, yeah, you say that. Uh, <laughs> I quite often do talks in front of people, and not, normally they want me to talk for an hour, and I've been known to talk for two and a half because mm -hmm. I think there's probably too many stories. <laughs> Good value for money on a book. <laughs> yeah, quite. Yeah, but I also think it's part of our heritage, isn't it? Mm. But what's really interesting with stories, especially for me, is the way we utilise language when we're telling the story okay. uh so we were i'm sure we were all at that level and people listening are probably maybe at that level now or i uh, can remember a time when you were just beginning in your canoe journey whether it's whitewater kayaking sea kayaking tra slalom training uh open canoe whatever it may be and somebody one of, maybe one of your mentors or somebody more experienced was telling a story about a journey and they were busy talking about, do you remember how big that wave was and we just mm. got annihilated and we had to go, oh, Jimmy swam, he lost his boat. And you can see that already, you know, it's building up the sort of the heart rate and the anticipation and the anxiousness. Mm. And I think as, as experienced people within the, within the sport, we have to be mindful of the way we describe events. Because when I'm chatting, you're chatting to you guys, I can say that, and we don't take that as an anxious thing. We just take that as a story. Mm. But when we're listening to that story, our minds are sort of playing tricks on us. How big was that wave? Or how long was that swim? Mm. You know, did he ever get his boat back? And it builds yeah. anxiety in people and it builds stress in people. And I think we just have to be mindful of it. And, uh, so, and, we, and we all, you know, we all tell those stories around campfires or in bars or wherever that may be. Mm. Now, but that's the good times as well, you know. I suppose it's like, yeah, the interestingly, the, the audience, I suppose, and what you're trying to uh, trying to trying to get across. And I noticed in 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 your stuff, Darren, you I suppose this idea of stories. You talk a lot about the fears and the lies that we tell us, the lies that yeah. we tell ourselves. And I think that's really that's quite a powerful word to use again, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I was going to, desperate to ask you, you know, to explain okay. to people a bit more about that. That'd be really really cool. Yeah, I, I think in our day to day life we tell uh, we sort of how can i phrase it in other day like we tell ourselves a lot of lies we tell mm. ourselves that we're confident and maybe we display confidence to other people we put on a persona uh maybe it's for, for, for a job or in a relationship or and we're not a hundred percent honest with ourselves uh we, we you know skirt around the edges you know we have a, a work persona that's one persona we have a relationship persona mm. that's another persona and so on and so on but when we're in the in the natural world, whatever discipline, I think nature can just strip us bare. It takes our ego away. It takes any uh, manifestation of a an avatar that we've put onto ourselves. It, it just mm. strips that away. And if if we sort of run with false pride into those environments, we just get beaten down. Mm. You know, we have to be in the moment in those environments. You know, if we walk into those environments with our chest puffed out and we're the big dog nature is just going to strip us bare mm. and, it, and nature shows us what our lies are if, if you know if we're quiet enough and gentle enough uh, with ourselves nature will show us what our lies are that we tell ourselves mm. you know, and nature will strip us back and nature will say no you know you are you are not this person that you are pretending to be mm. you know and it, it, it will it will allow us that space and i think that's a good space to be in yeah, yeah. It's sort of it, honesty it, and it, all that strips you. Yeah. Strips you strip us. But also, it'll tell us a thousand truths that we never knew about. So, going back into the story that you know, Nick's just told us, there may be times in our life where we feel maybe vulnerable, but we take the chance and we risk, you know, we don't call it risk assessment in everyday life, but we take a chance and we do something. <laughs> and then we go through something really difficult and we come out the other side. Mm. But lots of, lots of people hide from that. Uh, but when we actually do that, a certain truth comes to being that we are stronger than we thought and we can do that, you know, that, that thing, whether it be a box canyon or a hard point in our life. And we can, if we can do that in the ocean or in the river, we can actually do that in real life. We can make those commitments. We can make those changes. You know, we can run head into that, into that pathway. 
Yeah. No, I agree totally. Yeah. I think for me, it's about sitting with the discomfort. So it could be there are times when it's not very comfortable in the outdoors. You know, as much as we like to enjoy being out there, sometimes, you know, for example, uh, when I was I did the Three Peaks by kayak, you know, um, mm -hmm. Ben Nevis and uh, Scarfell Pike and Snowden, and uh, I was crossing Loose Bay, uh, southern end of Scotland there, and it, the tide was against me. It was a steaming hot day. And I was, I was about to give in. I was just about, oh, I'll go back to Muller Galloway. I'm just going to give up. And I thought, well, I'll just sit with it because the tide will change and it will obviously change in my favour in about three or four hours' time. All I have to do is just put up with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think that, and I think that's uh, that's the story for me. It's 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 then going into that that place where I'm uncomfortable. You know, I don't try and hide from it. You know, I tell myself the truth that you know I'm not very happy at the moment, <laughs> and uh, and then. In three or four hours time it changes and the message there is that this will pass mm. and you know when i was in hospital last year with with depression that's what the nurses would say to me nick this will pass you know this will this depression will go it's not going to last forever and uh, at the time i couldn't believe it but when i remembered that story of that that i created for myself down there and on in loose bay it was true you know it, in mm. a couple of months you know i was out of hospital and back on my feet again but uh, yeah. it's it, and it's a it's a cyclical thing it's not you know it's yeah. <laughs> i, I yeah. know that i'm going to get ill again but i'm going to have to face that truth again that i'm going to be uncomfortable and i'm going to have to sit with it and rather than try and fight it you mm. know that story about trying to fight nature as well you can't fight i can't fight nature right. i've just yeah. got to go with, just got to go with it i mean so many people talk their languages about trying to overcome the tides or beat the tides or beat the weather and, and mm. that's really, that's i just can't use that language it's about being with the tides being with the weather and uh just choosing my time and if, if i make a choice where i'm being beaten you know by the situation then that's something i've got to live with it's, it's not it's not about me against nature it's just about me against myself yeah, yeah. i think there's a really interesting thing here this is fascinating what you're saying this kind of this idea of impermanence is something that i've been trying to um think about you know is that perhaps it's something to do with our society and it's perhaps a lie that's told perhaps in mm. within our you know way of life some somewhat these days you know is that it's possible to have a sort of flat line and everyone will be happy this line is the happy line and everyone goes along mm. it and in fact actually we, we try when we're coming off that line it's really difficult and we there's all sorts of ways of you know that we're told may comfort us you know go and do this or get that or you know do this you know behavior or whatever and in fact, actually, something I'm actually really trying to do the last few weeks is really to to sit with discomfort and actually notice it, because actually after a while it either disappears or it changes and something mm. else happens. And so I, I think it's really interesting. And, and for sure, there's lots of times when you're freezing cold in your, in your boat or whatever. It's, you know, those the sports that I've done, but then they actually turn into really good stories later as well. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think that's yeah, uh, fascinating. Yeah. And one thing yeah. I picked up from both of you guys as well, I, I noticed um you both had a real um you, you've talked about paddling with other people but it's a really strong thing about this solo you know side of, of your paddling mm -hmm. i think that's a really interesting thing because i think that's something we've probably experienced a bit more of during the covid you know the lockdown and stuff and i wonder yeah. what your thoughts mm -hmm. are on, on 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 being solo you know and, and maybe okay. that's all the difference between those two things uh darren go on you can start yeah, yeah i mean i do I'm always a bit cagey about talking about solo paddling uh, because, because you know, guidelines and safety numbers and, and all that. Uh, so what I'm about to say is that my, is my personal experience. Mm -hmm. I'm not promoting and, and I oh, want to be clear. Making that clear, yeah. 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 So I do a lot of solo kayaking. Uh, I have solo kayaked all the rivers from Everest back to back. Uh, not the, not into Tibet, but in Nepal, I've soloed. Zarkchu and various rivers in Bhutan and various rivers in Nepal, India, but it's irrelevant where that solo takes place, really. Mm. But for you know, for me, it's it's not about me challenging nature; it's about me being in nature. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and, and for me, it's it slows everything down. When I'm on my local river, I get to spend time looking at the shadows as they fall over the rocks. Or the moss growing on the tree and when you're with your friends you don't see that 
Mm. Not, not yeah. as much because you just busy talking. You go, oh, that's a great line. You know, Johnny, that's mm. amazing. Yeah, well yeah. done. And you don't get time to just trip. One of my, you know, my favourite times to solo, uh, early dawn, when you've got when you get in the, you know, the new light coming through the trees and you pan it. It doesn't need to be a hard. River, it's just a beautiful time to be there. Yeah. And, it, and it sort of for me it frames my day. Uh, and it happens a lot in the winter because obviously when I'm in North Wales in the winter that's how it works. And it frames my day. When I'm on expedition and I'm solo and I can be by myself, 14, 15, 20 days maybe mm. on a trip. Yeah, and I can be by myself camping on beaches, carrying all my gear in my boat. And I paddle really long days when I'm by myself. I'll, pad I'll paddle 12, 13 hour days because I have no one to talk to. Yeah. And when I get, I, and when I get to camp, I have nothing to do but eat and think. Yeah. But the kayaking is sort of all the, all the demons, because I'm sure everyone has demons, whether they're big or small, yeah? And the demons have sort of been held at bay a little bit by kayaking because we've been in the present moment and we've paddled and I've paddled personally and I've made the lines and I'm exploring. But the minute I get to the beach, all those emotions can start to move in because you're tired. Mm. You're, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard of a thing called Halt, uh, Hungry Alone, Lonely and Tired. Okay. There's an acronym. Uh, and because, you know, you've paddled, I've paddled a long time and, my adrenaline is maybe gone now because I've paddled uh, white water. So all these sort of things that you try to push away come back in uh, as night falls. And uh, hopefully you're too exhausted to think about it. And you just fall asleep. And then you can, wake, you can wake up the following day and you can immerse yourself in nature and put yourself through that uncomfortable first few paddle strokes on a stiff body and not enough food and rinse the sand out of your hair and carry on going. And as, as a journey progresses for me, those those thoughts of, you know, that I'm sure we all have thoughts that uh, trouble us, whether it be have I paid my mortgage this month or how's my job going or how's this relationship and that relationship, uh, they, they can fade because you get more and more in the moment of the expedition. Mm. You know, and I'm, I'm quite into that. And it can be you know, a 10 minute paddle on the local river, right? it can be a 14 day trip or whatever it may be. Yeah, we've got a comment here from Alex. Uh, welcome all the comments in the chat, by the way. Thank you for commenting and, and I really appreciate you watching and, and making these things. Alex is saying, yeah, solo paddling is a tricky subject. We've had actually lots of, lots of, we've spurred around it quite a few episodes actually, because it seems, you know, it's something we've got to be really respectful of, you know, really think about, but it's something that's actually something that, you know, is, is really important in a lot of, of paddlers' lives. And it says, you know, He's always cage about it too, but he just loves it, especially in the OC, which I guess is the open Canadian. And and, and tell me, um, Nick, what about you? Um, what's you know you can see that your your um, your solo stuff is is that important to you? That solace, that um, that peace out there. Yeah, and, and again, it's just being with myself. So it's again that journeying with myself, immersed in the oceanic landscape. Mm. I mean. I'd, I love paddling with people, but uh, I suppose I'm quite selfish. I quite like to manage my own time, have my own agenda. Um, I like to make my own decisions. Um, mm -hmm. I like to assess risks for myself according to my own needs and yeah. uh, w wisdom. And uh, I like the idea of, of overcoming a challenge and ha having done it on my own. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm not somebody who seeks glory, but it's something that I I give myself. You know, it's like when I paddled around Scotland. You know, when I went to all the lifeboat stations in 2015, that was essentially a journey I did on my own. And um, you know, arriving at the end of it, it was just like a a massive massive boost for me. Uh, so from that point of view, it was it was really life affirming. Um, but there, there's something about being at one with that landscape, uh, the seascape, and being on my own. Um, it's, it's quite difficult to put it into words because uh, I guess it's just so, it, I, when I find it difficult to talk about words or find words to describe something, it, mean, it, it means that it's very deep within me. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, words almost don't do these sorts of things justice today. It's difficult to, uh, to get the word, so, words right. So, 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 for example, um, going around a headland that I've been worrying about for ages, you know, building it up in my head and then getting there and having the most amazingly beautiful, serene experience. 
it's just so um so fundamentally raw you know it's it's there aren't any words that can describe it it's just it's it's there as a feeling yeah. and when i recall it i'll go back to that feeling rather than you know yeah. descriptions um so yeah and that I mean, there are there's that saying that i look quite like you know solitude is the word that we use to describe the joy of being alone okay and and, lo and loneliness yeah. is, is the word we use to des describe the pain of being alone so okay. um yeah yeah and uh, there, so there have been times when we've been paddling, and I have felt lonely, <laughs> mm. particularly, particularly when I've been shorebound after four days, you know, getting a bit tent crazy. Mm. But generally, um, I've always felt that solitude has been my my greatest comfort. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want to ask, can I just follow on from that, Nick? Uh, so the, yeah. So some of that you touched on me about making your own decisions. And what I find with solo paddling is it's not even the big decisions that matter, it's the little decisions. When you when you go to a river with your friends and maybe they're driving and you're a passenger, yeah. and maybe they're, maybe they're driving a little bit erratic for you or too yeah. slow for you, and then they've got music on that you don't like, you know, or they're not parking in the lay-by that you'd normally park in to do the shuttle or whatever. And yeah. you can feel, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in this, but you can maybe feel a little bit of anxiousness especially if they've got horrendous drum and bass music on, you know, and, uh, you, you know, your heart rate's already elevated before you even get on. Uh, and if you, when you're solo, you're in charge of all those little things, aren't you? You're in charge of where you stop for your coffee, you know, if you get coffee before you go, and mm. you're in charge of how you do your shuttle, if you're doing a shuttle, and you're in charge of the pace of that trip. And I find I find comfort in those things, and I'm, I think a lot of people find discomfort when other people take control. Uh, even, and we know in groups. I mean, some people find comfort in it, and I'm not saying they don't. Uh, mm. But I I know that some people also take discomfort in it. And for yeah. those people who take discomfort, it may be it's it's maybe then shared and as anxiousness or nervousness or just being generally unsure. Mm. And, uh, and I, I take, you know, for me, soloing sort of takes that away a little bit. Mm. No, it's really, it's, it's, it's really interesting. We have, we've had lots of people. We had Nuria Newman on a few weeks ago. In fact, the first one, I know, uh, second one, I think it was. And mm. yeah, she did some quite interesting stuff solo. We didn't really get the chance to fully, to fully unpack it. And I guess while we're talking about solo paddling, just anyone out there who's into that idea, use your brain. And basically, you've got to be super sensible about how you do that stuff. So yeah. I just wanted to come back, Nick. Uh, you know, there's something here. Uh, you know, you had some big plans for 2020. There was a couple that stand, stood out for me. You had a plan to, to, to basically to kayak 2,020 miles this year and yeah. visit all four medieval castles on one map that you yeah. know, prior yeah. to see. And I guess that's all all changed now. And, and how was that like letting that one go? Because that must have been must have been tough. I mean, I guess you can all do it in twenty twenty one. Let's hope. You know, Tosh I can do. I mean, I'm, I'm I've, now that I'm back on the water. I'm sort of hoping that I can get quite close to two thousand and twenty kilometers. Actually, um, oh excuse me, yeah, that's a <laughs> significant okay. difference. But, yeah. but um, I think I think it's just just give it a go, really, and just and just enjoying the experience. And I've got, hopefully when uh, we can get out on longer trips, you know, I'm going to paddle around Mull and just keep it local and explore my coastline. Mm. Um, I was saying today to the person... You found yourself doing that in even more depth than normally, you know, now you're like looking, because I've been on my river just out front here. You yeah. Know, I went up a little tributary the other day. I was like, this is super cool. I've, I've never gone up it probably. Exactly, yeah. I've always just seen the uh, the sound of Mull as somewhere that um, I've poodled about in just, just, just because I can go other places, but having got to know the Sound of Mile over the last few weeks, I just suddenly realised what a beautiful place it is to paddle. And uh, you know, I'm getting to know where I'll find otters, or um, oh, get, you know, there's um, a place where there's a little blowhole. So when the tide and the wind are in a certain direction, you know, I can go and sit there and get the waves splashing oh, yeah. over me and play around a bit. And it's, it's getting to know the intricacies of my local space. Mm -hmm. And and I guess it's, it's 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 about being intimate as well. That's the other word I like to use when I'm out outdoors. Mm -hmm. It's intimacy, and it's creating a an intimate relationship with the space that I'm in. Um, which is another reason why I paddle alone, because like as you were saying, Darren, it's it's about noticing the 
the colors and the, the, the textures and, and you know not having the distractions of a, a conversation um, it's being able to then choose to stop and just sit and just watch and, and listen and feel um, yeah so so in terms of the challenges yes yeah, so, I mean I've just just going to see what happens this year and uh, what unfolds really <laughs> and what about you Darren how have you been how have you been as is, is, is this kind of blown up road of coaching horses through all your plans or are you kind of you look like a fairly relaxed guy Can you just sort of see what's going on? <laughs> uh, yeah it's it scuppered my plans quite a bit actually I, I had obviously I run a business in the Himalayas and the minute we got the minute Covid came as, a, as like a bigger thing not just uh, isolated cases we had to cancel all our trips which mm. is fine and I understand that but per, on a personal level I was supposed to be doing first descent in Afghanistan mm. wow. uh, so I had to I had to put that on the sideline and I'd also planned uh, a coast-to-coast -coast walk in Britain uh, St Beast to Robin Hood's Bay as a walk mm. obviously I've, I've put that to one side I might do it in the winter but I'll put that to one side but one thing that I've been sat thinking about a lot is when I do get back on the river, I'm you know back in Britain and I get on to, I get to paddle regularly. I'm actually going to go revisit all the places I learned to paddle. All right, yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to go straight into paddling the water that I left. You know when 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 COVID hit and I I was paddling maybe class four or five. I'm not going to go straight back into that. You know I will have had twelve weeks, forty weeks, whatever it is off. So I'm going to go revisit the places that brought me along. Yeah, in a, yeah. In a, in a similar kind of way, and I, I thought a lot about this. In a similar kind of way that, you know, when you when you become like a teenager and you look back to your nursery school teachers and how mm -hmm. they brought you to be a teenager, in a similar sort of way to that. So I am going to visit the places and on the flat water and the easier water that I learnt my white water skills on. So mm -hmm. much so that so much so that I've just got hold of a boat. That was one of the first boats I ever paddled, so I can oh. use that. So I can use that boat and revisit the places that I, when I was 14, 15, 16, and just revisit those places with the boat that I used at the time, yeah. and just and just connect again. We've got know. so much love coming in here, guys. I've got to just give you a little bit of a chat. Look, there's so many people super happy with what you're saying. You know, the the the, the depth, the the yeah. and talking is going is going well here. This is Paul. <laughs> I was going to ask Darren, just you know, I'm always curious. You can't, you can't. What what boat is this boat that you're going to go back into this old school? So when I when I first learned to paddle, uh, my first <laughs> boat that I got, uh, I think it was a birthday or Christmas present. Uh, I paddled for a while, and I'm I learned to paddle in scouts, and then I joined yeah, a canoe. Scouts, club. We're always bigging up the scouts yeah. on this show. Love the scouts. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm a scout adventurer. Scouting got me into kayaking, but I then joined a canoe club. And in my transition from scouting to the canoe club, one of the scout leaders lent me his boat, and he lent me a, a blue Dancer XT. Dancer, oh. wow, yeah, That's beautiful right. boat, beautiful boat. And then when I bought my own boat, which was obviously my parents, uh, but I bought a black Dancer, so I didn't get the wow. XT. So yeah. I got a black Dancer with yellow stripes, uh, like a John Player special racing car, and I, I paddled a lot in that. I really enjoyed that boat, but. I, I didn't want to get a dancer, but the boat I aspired to at that time was a Corsica because that was yes. a player boat. That was a player boat, wasn't it? My uh, scout leader had a Corsica, and I was like, yeah, that yeah. was a good looking, desirable craft in its day. Yeah. Not the Corsica S because I'm not a freestyle. I'm not a rodeo paddler, you know, this is a Corsica. Okay. Isn't it? I think he had a Corsica S now, I think about it. Yeah, so, this, so I've just been gifted a Corsica by the club that I started in uh, that I'm going to use, and obviously I'll, I'll give it back to the club. So I'm going to use that boat. Um, and I just think it's, and I'm going to paddle it spec. The, the boat is is spec, you know, it's as it was when it was built. Oh, yeah, so okay. no, so there's there's no purity that. here by the sounds of things. Of yeah, this, so, you know, I've, I've paddled the boat a lot. I mean, I paddled it on the on the Glen a few years ago. Not the same boat, not the same model, the uh, same one I've got now, but a different colour. But I paddled it spec, so I paddled it with the footrest it came with out of the factory in. It didn't come with hip pads because boats didn't come with hip pads at the time. You yeah. made them yourself. <laughs> <laughs> a box, an old style back band, and uh, I, you know, I paddle it as it would have come out of the factory. Uh, because I just think it's important to connect where I am now with my historical paddling. So you'll be able to see the difference, you'll be able to really kind of know, find the journey that you've been on, and kind of yeah, see. Yeah, I just think that's really nice. And while I'd love to get back on, you know, my favorite river in North Wales is the Glen, I'd love to get straight back on the Glen. But I know that after 
three months off the water mm. that my skills will be rusty. Yeah. Well, sorry, what was your what's your favourite river? On in the way? Conway, the fairy, the fairy glen section of the Conway. All right. Yeah. And uh, it's my you know it's my favourite river. I love the Maudac as well. The Maudac's really close to where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just going to go back and spend a little <laughs> bit of time reconnecting to why I paddle in the first place, what it means to me before I then get on and and push myself again. Because I think yeah. it's important. I think it's important to be grounded in in why we do this this sport or rec you know we call it a sport or a recreation or whatever we want to call it. Because uh, obviously you come from a you know sport background and I come from a recreation background. Yeah, and, but it's a thing, right? It's a yeah. it's a life. It's a, it's everything. You know, it's yeah. a, for me for for me certainly. And, and Nick, I was going to ask you as well, man. I'm thinking you're all the way up there in, in on Mull. How many boats do you have, or do you just have one trust? Uh, you have one. a few. One sea kayak, yeah. In yeah. fact, uh, I, I got it for my big trip in 2015, but I'm determined to keep her now. You know, yeah. um, I'm going to actually come over to Nottingham. Hopefully, Howard Jeffs will. He needs. Do you know Howard? You know, Howard Jeffs. Oh yes, yeah, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, he's, he's he lives in Nottingham, sea kayak and boat boat designer and builder. Oh, he's, I'm, I'm going to book her book her in there for him to have a good. Uh, Good working. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but, uh, it's funny you're talking about uh, you know your dance and the Mirage was my boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the river that I cut my teeth on was the Dulas down in um, oh. near near yeah. And then 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 the Malbec and nearly lost my life on the Malbec. You know, paddled it in spate when I shouldn't have done. Yeah. And ended up swimming down the graveyard there um, underwater yeah. a lot of the way. <laughs> but um, yes. Just those those days of because uh, those boats were cutting edge at the time, weren't they? I mean, you, yeah. you, you, the, when you've got a plastic boats, so you moved on from the, the good old fiberglass things, and you could paddle these boats with gay abandon and go over these drops that you probably never thought of doing before, and yeah, it just gave you that confidence to bounce off rocks and yeah, definitely. Um, I, you know, I think it's important that we connect to why we started as well. I think. Yeah. Important, you know, it's important for a journey, isn't it, that we connect to that, and uh, yeah. you know, and it's also important that we connect uh, in a in a way that I've, I've, I've briefly touched on earlier, because you know, this like this life that we have as kayakers or canoeists or whatever, it is family, isn't it? You know, not just the people we paddle with, but the actual nature we immerse in. You know, we, mm. we, it feels like family, and I, I really like that. Mm. It's definitely I, I was reading in, in your uh your blog nick you were talking about this you know this deep this deep connection you know and we talk about the creatures and i guess all that, mm. that this stuff is you know I, I feel very envious actually of you being able to see you were talking about sea otters uh before we came on as well i don't think i've seen a sea otter before i'd love to mm. get to see one of them do, do you feel do, do you have a you know, to, to the animals that you see when you're out sea kayaking, does that, you know, is, that, is it the whole package or is it something about these? There's some very special creatures that I guess you get to see. Yeah, I definitely get very excited. Uh, I mean, an otter, very luckily, you know, we see just about every day I go paddling, but, um, you know, dolphins and basking sharks, you know, when you get to see those, you certainly feel very privileged and excited. Uh, minky whales, sometimes we come across those when I'm kayaking. Um, the puffins this time of year with the puffins, you, you're paddling out to Staffer and Nunga, um, and the, the puffins are nesting out there at the moment. Mm. But just uh, you know, just having close encounters, you know, like if it's a seal, you see seals every day, but sometimes a seal will come up and nudge the boat, or um, I've had seals try and climb onto the boat. And, oh, really? And it's just just those encounters where you, you just feel that that connection. Mm. Um, yeah, just you know, like uh, paddling into this uh, the bay we went into yesterday, with all these nursing seal pups, and and it's just incredible. I've never, never, I've been there loads of times, but never been there this time of year, and suddenly realised that it's a huge nursery for common seals, which um, oh, beautiful, which is amazing. And so these these creatures were were you know using the word nursing. They were they were nursing their their young ones by allowing the young ones to swim on their backs. It's right. almost like they're teaching them to swim in the swimming pool. You know, it's like uh, as humans did with their babies. So just come to me, um, and that was very special. You know, and uh, I mean, it, it just being able to be very quiet—that's what I love about sea kayaking. Is it's yeah, yeah. You just, just stop paddling and just drift. 
mm. and it just become part of the landscape yeah and I think there's, a, there's another interesting thing that I came across in, in getting ready for this. It was basically that in Scotland, you, you can actually prescribe uh, time in, the, in nature for your, yeah, for your mental GP. health. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for your GP. And I think that, that sounds like a, a really great idea. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, I was wondering, you know, if we're talking, you know, we've talked a lot about kayaking for, for mental health here, but mm. what, what other things are part of your practice for keeping, you know, healthy? And, and I kind of, sometimes I think mental health is about, we, we, we have a very strict definition of those mm. things in our society, but do we need them actually? I believe there could be actually more, more one sort of thing, but I don't know yet. Yeah. Nick, what about you? Do, do you have other things that you see as a sort of pillar of your, of your, of your, of your mental health to try and stay, stay, stay um, heal? No pun intended in the old, yeah. uh, I mean, it's, it's getting out and camping. I mean, I just love, and I know that at this difficult time, we shouldn't be wild camping, but I have to say that, uh, you know, I have um, taken myself off because I just, I need that space, you know, and um, just having that ability to, again, solitude, you know, just putting the tent up and, and sitting in a wild location. Um, and it, sometimes it takes an effort to do that. And I, it's not, it's not, it's not always easy for me to to motivate myself to get outdoors. So it, if if you do liken it to a medicine, sometimes it is it is quite a hard pill to swallow, particularly if the weather's a little bit inclement. And I've got to get myself out of my my doldrums and get out of, out of the house, get away from the internet or whatever it is that I'm using to to numb myself. Yeah, and, and to get out get out there and and not numb myself but become more alive that's that's the whole key it's like um yeah. as you as you were saying very early on darren about being present and being in the moment that's that's when i become part of myself again is when i'm out in nature because as you say you can't hide you know it's 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 where i am it's where it, if it's raining then i've got to deal with it you know i can't i can't avoid it i've got to put my wet wet you know my rain poop, rain rain jacket on or or I get wet, or if it's blowing a huli, find shelter, you know, deal with it. If I'm thirsty, find a stream, deal with it, rather than being in the house where I can numb myself with just mindless, mindless mm. um, activity. Really and I can, I, can spend a, I can spend a whole day, and by the end of the day in the house, I won't have done anything. And yet, if I've m made an effort to get out, and if it's just maybe two hours, you know, go up, yeah, some lovely little walks around us, um, and just get out there and get the wind blowing through my yeah my short hair. You know. Nature connection. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it's and it's uh, it's being grateful for that as well, rather than yeah. taking it for granted. Granted, you know. Well, uh, I mean, you guys, are, I've got to say, from what, what I can hear, you're you're very lucky. There's not everybody gets a chance to to do these things, and I yeah. think that's something we've certainly you know during the pandemic. I think people have you know even getting into their local. Yeah, park, I do. I really like appreciate that. that. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, uh, yeah, sounds extraordinary. Uh, yeah. and, and Darren, what about you? Because I think you know we've been skirting around it. We've not used that word mindfulness, but this is all really so much to do yeah. with mindfulness for me. You know, I'm like, you know, this is a this is a just a word. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Yeah. So it might be interesting to what where you come at it from that. Yeah, so uh, I'm just going to touch on what Nick spoke about as well uh, before I answer the mindfulness one. For for everyone. Our physical health is really apparent. You know, we ourselves can see, you know, if we're getting fitter and stronger physically, and our friends and family can see us if we're losing physical fitness. You know, that's obvious, isn't it? It's an obvious, and we, you know, in the modern world, we're sold a thousand protein drinks, or we sold gym membership and whatever. But our mental health, we, we, we sort of keep it closely guarded a lot of the time. Mm. And I think we need to, start opening up a culture or a peer, or as peers where we say to our friends I'm struggling today or I'm really good today and we, we're just honest about it and we don't try and shield it you know I'm a Yorkshireman from a certain generation and you know <laughs> blokes are really bad at sort of hiding our emotions yeah. when you, you know a friend asks you and says how are you getting on and you go yeah I'm all right and then you crack on with your day uh, mm -hmm. but when you go outside and you go into nature, nature will tell you if you're not. Nature mm. will tell you if you're telling a little fib on that. Mm. So, you know, I'm blessed by the fact I live where I live in Wales and from my back door, I can walk out and I'm straight into woodland. Mm. I'm straight I'm straight into a little stream. 
you know, I'm straight out into nature. And even if it's just a 20 minute walk, I can hear the sheep. There's a farm down the, down the lane that's got alpacas mm. uh, and little ponies. And, you know, I'm straight in there. And people, I think, that live in cities, perhaps, where you're living in uh, much tighter spaces, I think that's much harder to get out and explore. Mm. Where you may go into your gym and be physically fit. Yeah. But you, no might not, you, might not be, you, you might not be mentally healthy. Because you might be enclosed, you might be plugged into YouTube, or you might be listening to podcasts. <laughs> it's, all right. it's cool. Which, you know, it's cool. But, you know, you, you might sort of hide. From, yeah, <laughs> but you might hide from the world a little bit. So I do think it's important uh, for your for mental health, personal health, however you want to see it, that you get out and you don't have to necessarily walk up a mountain or go kayaking or go canoe. You can no, just skate. In, yeah. Yeah, you can just sit uh, and slow down, listen to the birds singing, listen to the wind in the trees, mm. you know, watch that cloud drift across the sky. Maybe you're just going to listen to your breath as you breathe in and breathe out and your mind might drift and then bring it back to the breath and just breathe in and breathe out. And as your mind drifts, bring it back to your breath. And for me, that's what mindfulness is. That's where mindfulness sits, bringing it back to the breath and being in the present moment mm. and just absorbing yourself in how your body is. Because we kid ourselves all the time that our bodies are uh, independent of our mental state and vice versa, you know. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, it's not, and we kid ourselves, you know, we kid ourselves that I'm going to go and have some fast food to make me feel better mm. because we know that sugars and fats make us feel better. But long term, we know that's not true. Mm. Uh, but we kid ourselves, we tell ourselves those spibs, don't we, those lies. But mindfulness, being in the moment, sitting down, pausing, pausing for the cause, breathing, uh, and just being gentle to yourself. Mm. You know, uh, I think that's really important. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think being, being kind is, is, is definitely, you know, it's not being hard on yourself. Um, and certainly when I'm on a journey, it's, it's, it's to look, is to not set myself expectations, which I will constantly come up against, you know, is, is, is being realistic. Mm -hmm. There's something else that's just occurred for me while we've been chatting is, is we talk a lot about solitude and being solo, but I also find when I'm outdoors that I end up having far more in-depth and intimate conversations with, with people. And I was just thinking about today paddling with my friend, you know, another bloke here from Tobamori. And we, today we were talking about suicide and, you know, men aren't very good at talking about mental health. And, you know, he, he and I, he was very interested in my, my suicide attempt last year and, and my subsequent hospital, hospitalization and how they get very much about how our conversation is going this evening about what it is, you know, sea kayaking does for me in terms of keeping me well. And then he opened up about himself and um, totally surprised me because you know, he's come across to me as somebody who's always been in control. Mm. And, yet, and yet he shared uh, some very intimate and information about himself and his mental health. Mm. And it's because we were out there, we've had this this shared experience, this shared space. And there we were on the water. And it was totally, um, I suppose, unusual. But we felt able to sit and chat. And we had that. that and it wasn't, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't heavy or therapeutic. It was a conversation, and then, yeah. and then we just moved on naturally. We didn't, we didn't try and avoid it or mm. uh, uh, shy away from it or delve into it any deeper. It just, just talked. Yeah, I think there's that. You know, for me, it's yeah, the sort of vulnerability of these places, which can you know take you, take you to bits. You know, that creates yeah. a different place, and and I think that vulnerability normally creates interesting uh, interesting thoughts, but. Hey guys, look, I'm, I'm I'm super sorry. We're we're coming towards the end. I know lots and lots of people. We had so many yeah. comments. We had one earlier. I had to just uh, pick that out of the uh, where was that um, Phil McDonald? Here we go. I say he's love it. It was so much love for the chat tonight. It says once Phil McDonald wants to get back into sea kayaking again and white water mm. kayaking. So you know this kind of this side of, uh, of of our sport that we've been talking about is really mm. you know the kind of slightly deeper side. I think is is really really interesting and hold on we've got another oh yeah good conversation all the way from italy let's see this guy here he's out he's watching from mimo uh ciao mimo from bari italy there we go see you soon 
there we go so look guys i just want to say thank you very very much indeed before we before we sort of uh start to wrap up you anything else that you want to share just to get off your chest or tell anything that's in, important for our viewers to to hear or yeah, I think, you know, I think <laughs> it's fine, guys. Just but like, as, as Nick has said, and I've said that people that listen to to my uh, podcast or whatever, just be gentle on yourself and mm. walk te walk tender. Especially if we're getting back into paddling now after lockdown, uh, just just be kind to yourself. You know, it's okay. It's gonna be good. I think. Yeah. We've, yeah. I think that's a lovely, a lovely thought. I and mean, I picked up on that, you know, this COVID thing has, has taught us a bit about being gentle and what's important and, and to, to ourselves and to other people as well. We're, we're, we've all been suffering to some degree. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Nick, I butted in front of you. Go on, what were you about to say there, my friend? Sorry. No, no, no. That was a great way to finish, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. look, you know, yeah. I, I just got to be so, you know, so, so grateful for you being on here, you know, talking about some of these things are really, uh, really important. It's, you know, more and more people are getting on the you know this idea that mental health is a thing and we need to kind of get get talk about it and you know if you need help put your hand up and ask for it you know but darren you know and nick you've spoke about understanding your own mind and, and trying to kind of go on that journey so i just think you know i think uh, it's really really important that if anyone has uh, this is conversation has brought anything up for people if anyone's got you know thoughts and ideas that they need to, to speak about, you know, head to mind.org.uk and samaritans.org. These are two organizations that are fantastic to help people who are struggling a little bit. And, uh, you know, obviously grateful. I'm sure they've been busy in these times, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, I want to just start to say thank you again. You know, don't forget everybody, if you want to watch any of these episodes, they're all on the British Canoe Paddles portal on Facebook, on YouTube. All of them are going to be turned into podcasts on the Clear Access Clear Waters website. Next week, we've got a super interesting guest, Tom Watson, who stepped down as deputy leader of the Labour Party at the end of 2019, and Andrew Denton, chief executive of the Outdoor Industry Association. So that sounds like an interesting two people. Anyway, we're going to talk about um, Tom's life in politics and his amazing personal story, how he changed his lifestyle and got involved in paddling and overcame diabetes. And there's going to be also interesting stuff uh, about Andrew and the personal physical challenges that he's uh, undertaken last summer. So, yeah, I hope you can join us. Gents, once again, thank you so much. So much love uh, on the on the Facebook and the different platforms for your being here tonight. Very, very grateful. I wish you well for the rest of this uh, okay. peculiar times that we're in here. And, um, well... I, uh, I, I'll maybe see you in the real world one day and maybe I'll have to come and visit visit you all. Um, You're yes. welcome. Yeah. It'd be lovely. Oh. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Yeah. Cheers Darren. Yep. Yeah.